Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all our friends around the world. On behalf of Mandala, I'd like to welcome everyone to our dialogue with Fritz of Capra, to whom I also extend a very warm and gracious welcome. Uh, before I formally, great, welcome, Fritz of. Before I formally introduce our guest, um, I'd like to express my hope that everyone is in good health, both physical and mental. There's one thing we've learned lately is that we can't take our health for granted, uh, nor our planets for that matter. I'd also like to take the first two minutes of our time together to give some context, show us why today's dialogue with Fritjof is so fitting, both in terms of space and time. For that, allow me to take you back to 2006, when I co-founded Mandala, which today we define as a conscious innovation consultancy. At the time, it was our understanding that the market, generally speaking, was losing touch with reality, seeking profit for the sake of profit, and often at the expense of social and environmental imperatives, which we were only beginning to truly take seriously. We felt this would eventually backfire. So we began helping organizations of all shapes and sizes around the world innovate from a place where profit and purpose intersect. It was our hypothesis then and our conviction today that the future of business is and must be purpose-driven. Recent events have shown us why. Purpose means you're doing something for the world. It brings value and meaning to people's lives, and it keeps our planet healthy and resilient. The challenge now for everyone is coherence, ensuring that one's purpose is alive and thriving in all touch points of an organization. This is what we are working towards today at Mandala. Now, for all of this to happen, organizations, they need to see the place they hold in their greater ecosystem. They need to understand the ripple effects of the decisions they make. And they need to make a choice around the legacy they want to live today and leave behind tomorrow. This is where a system's view of life becomes crucial, showing the interconnectedness and the inseparability of who you are as an organization and the society and planet you are part of. Only by seeing the bigger picture and your place within it can you decide the impact you want to have. This is what's at stake for every leader in politics, business, and civil society at this <clears> very moment. And this is why having Fritjof with us today is such a blessing. Fritjof is a systems theorist, scientist, researcher, author, and educator. He's the founding director of the Center for Eco-Literacy at Berkeley, California, where he lives with his family. But more importantly, having known him for close to 10 years now, I can say Fridjof is a generous man with a beautiful soul. So thank you so much for being with us, Fridjof. It's a great pleasure, Lorenzo. I really look forward to this uh, dialogue. Uh, I enjoy your beautiful tropical background and uh, it's, I'm happy to be here. Great. To everyone that's watching, uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves and send your questions in the chat box. Uh, remember to select send your message to all attendees so that everyone can see what you've asked. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And um, the first 10 questions that we don't get to, Fritjof was kind enough to agree to answer them in writing over the coming days. So to be honest, Fritjof, I have uh, enough questions that would take us through next week. So to be honest, uh, picking and choosing won't be easy. Yes. Um, but I think we have an obligation to begin with the obvious. So my first question to get things started, from a systems perspective, can you bluntly help us understand what in the world is happening on planet Earth right now? Yes, well, an essential question today, and as you can imagine, I have thought a lot about that over the last three months. Um, in my view, the COVID pandemic must be seen as a biological response of Gaia, our living planet, to the social and environmental emergency that humanity has brought upon itself. As we now know, COVID-19 originated in an ecological imbalance and it had the devastating consequences that we are witnessing now because of social and uh, economic imbalances. So very briefly, the origin um, is related to our massive intrusions into ecosystems around the world. 
such as the Brazilian rainforest, but not only that, ecosystems around the world. And one of the many harmful consequences of this impact has been that viruses that used to live in symbiosis with certain species of animals where they did no harm, jump from those animals to humans where they are toxic and even deadly. And we know that the HIV, the virus that caused AIDS, jumped from uh, a species of monkeys in West Africa to humans and, uh, you know, uh, resulted in the AIDS pandemic. Similarly, the coronavirus jumped from the species of bats in China to humans and then traveled around the world. And in the, uh, in the expansion of the epidemic uh, and of infections, Population density is a key variable, as we now know, and this is why we keep sheltered and distancing and so on. But if you think of it, population density is often connected with excessive profit maximizing. And this is how the systemic thinking comes in, contextual thinking, relating it to, to other phenomena. So, for example, take the, the cruise ships, the giant cruise ships, that were the first hotspot of COVID-19, where people are put together in very narrow environments. They keep the cabins very small on these cruise ships. Why? Because they want people to stay mostly in the restaurants and bars and boutiques to spend money and not in their cabins. Other forms of mass tourism were hotspots. Then uh, people living in crowded environments because of economic inequality, um, uh, people uh, who work in, uh, in these awful meatpacking factories, again, you know, very tightly together. Well, these factories shouldn't exist in the first, first place. But, but now, you see, the COVID pandemic shows us that during this time, questions of social justice and social equality, which before were issues of politics, of left versus right politics, now become issues of life and death. So, uh, you know, Gaia is teaching us some very important lessons. And the question will be, will humanity listen and act accordingly? Let me um, bandwagon on your, your last comment about the social uh, equality and economic justice. It, it's no secret to anyone that the neoliberal free market and visible hand paradigm, it's been challenged, uh, perhaps like right. never before. And the world may seem to be richer in an absolute sense, but uh, certainly not wealthier uh, in a relative sense, uh, as seen through the continuous widening of the inequality gap. Uh, and in fact, money and wealth are two different things, as you've mentioned in some of your articles. I think everyone would agree that there can't be prosperity without economic justice and social, uh, social equality. Can you help us understand the fundamental fragilities uh, with the current economic system and how do we address them systemically? Because it seems like this has been kind of a tragedy in the making for, for, for decades yes. now, right? Yes. So how do we kind of uh, do a pit stop and then change course? Yes. Well, let, let me first say a word about what systemic thinking is, putting on my hat as a teacher here. Uh, uh, what we are seeing today is a fundamental change of paradigms from seeing the world as a machine composed of separate objects to understanding it as a network, a network of relationships and, you know, networks within networks. Now, a network, as everybody knows, is a certain pattern of links, of relationships. And therefore, thinking in terms of networks means thinking in terms of patterns and of relationships. And uh, in a network, uh, ecology has shown us in ecological networks that maximizing any single variable in a network will invariably put stress uh, on the network as a whole. I mean, you can imagine a, a physical uh, web, and if you pull it in, in any part of it excessively, then it will put stress on the entire network. And so maximizing profits, maximizing economic growth, 
uh, creates these vulnerabilities in, in the economy as a whole. And what we are seeing uh, in our neoliberal economics is an irrational, and I would say pathological obsession with quantitative economic growth. It should be obvious to anybody that continuing growth on a finite planet is not possible. It's ridiculous that most of our economists and politicians still hang on to this illusion that we can grow and grow and grow. So what we need very urgently, in my view, is a fundamental shift from quantitative to qualitative growth. Because growth, of course, is an essential property of life. All living uh, organisms grow, but they don't grow in an unlimited way. In an ecosystem, for instance, certain things grow while other things decline, disintegrate, and release their components, which become resources for new growth. So this kind of multifaceted growth, um, which is well known to, to biologists and ecologists, is what I call qualitative growth. And that's what we need in our economic system. And Fritjof, what happens if we don't transition to this type of mindset? Um, I think we can obviously uh, feel very uh, inspired and enthusiastic about the possibilities that this crisis is giving us to switch courses, because to a certain extent, we're, we're feeling this uh, in, in such a profound way um, that the trauma associated with it gives us a window of opportunity to kind of do a self-critique and, and to change. But don't we need to consider the very dangerous alternative of not shifting courses? So what does, what does systems theory say about a system that's fallen terminally ill? That has it reached irreversibility? Is there a point where there's no more margin for resilience? So what does the death of a system actually look like? And what are the right preconditions for life after death? So what does a, the rebirth of a system look like? Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, the systems view of life uh, gives us a very interesting perspective on this. Uh, the, what I call the systems view of life, and which, which I synthesized in, in, in my recent work in, in my textbook, which is called the systems view of life, co-authored with Pierluigi Luisi, um, uh, this, this view um, is uh, uh, a view that is based in part on complexity theory, one of the most exciting developments in mathematics and in science. And complexity theory has shown us that uh, living systems, which, as we all know, generally maintain themselves in the state of balance, known as homeostasis, every now and then reach points of instability where there may either be a breakdown of the system or a breakthrough to a new state of order. And this breakthrough, uh, generally known now as emergence because a new order emerges, this emergence is you know, one of the key uh, uh, discoveries of complexity theory and can be applied to our current multifaceted crisis. There may be a breakdown and human civilization may just disintegrate, or there may be a breakthrough to a new order, which would be an order of uh, um, ecological balance and social justice, an order where we value uh, the values of human dignity and ecological sustainability. Are there specific signals that we can be attuned to that would lead us to believe that we're moving towards one direction and not the other? Or is it the kind of thing that just time will tell? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, to quote one of my heroes, Bob Dylan, uh, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Uh, we don't know. We are at knife's edge now. Obviously, we are seeing the lethal elements of our crisis with, you know, temperatures in the Arctic rising with, uh, you know, huge fires around the world, hurricanes, inundations. We see all the effects of uh, uh, the climate catastrophe, uh, which, uh, you know, my fellow activists and I warned about 30 years ago, 
you know and now 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 we're living it we we're, we're seeing the effects and and so but we are also seeing positive effects that um ecological awareness and systemic thinking is growing we now have a uh, a global civil society um, to which Brazil contributed enormously with the World Social Forum, which was held in Porto Alegre, uh, which uh, I attended, uh, one of them I attended. And so um, systemic thinking is very widespread in civil society and it's uh, uh, less widespread but significantly um, existent in the business world, in business people like yourself and, and uh, many others who, who have a new business culture. And sadly, it's uh, least uh, practiced in politics, although there are also some politics who are systemic and ecological thinkers. But, uh, you know, all in all, I think, and we can talk about this in more detail maybe later on, there's also great reason for hope. Let's talk about leadership. I think uh, a lot of us are asking ourselves, uh, what is it that we can do to accelerate this agenda and avoid this uh, climatic apocalypse that we're, that we're driving towards for, for so long? What kind of leadership is most compatible with effective systems change? Now, I ask this within the backdrop of several decentralized movements that are uh, stripping traditional political, social, and economic structures from exaggerated power, as well as the blatant failure of male elites to get the job done right. In fact, countries with women at the helm at this very moment, like Germany, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway, New Zealand, they've managed to preserve the livelihood of their constituents during this crisis, more so than most countries around the world. Don't you agree that it's time for men to relinquish their positions of power? and invite women to take over and, and work their magic, do what we were not able to do. And also uh, uh, another part to this question, because you are a distinguished Leonardo DiCaprio, um, DiCaprio Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci a biographer, um, one of the original systems thinkers, I'd like to ask, how would he lead uh, at a time like this? Yeah, well, there are a bunch of questions here. I, I can discern at least three. So let me, let me talk a little bit about leadership in general. Uh, you see that the systems view uh, gives us a new notion of leadership. Uh, if uh, the creativity of life is manifest in the process of emergence that I described before, so that the emergence of novelty is a key characteristic of life at all levels of life. We see that creativity uh, expresses itself in this dynamics of emergence, which we know in great deal in great deal in great detail now how it works. We know that from complexity theory, and if that is true also in social networks and, and social systems, then it would seem that leadership would be best practiced by facilitating emergence, not by prescribing a certain way of acting and giving, uh, you know, uh, commands, uh, but by preparing the environment so that creativity and emergence are most likely to happen. And it seems indeed uh, that women are better at that than, than we are, uh, and the examples you mentioned are, you know, key examples. Uh, uh, if, if I may begin with the US where I live, we have our young AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a dynamite congresswoman who uh, really embodies this kind of leadership. Uh, she's 30 years old and one of the most exciting young leaders in this country. You mentioned Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who is 39, and again has fantastic leadership and uh, was one of the few leaders who really managed the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, very, very well. 
in New Zealand is one of the countries that has done best. But she showed her qualities, you know, l long before the COVID pandemic. We have uh, Sanna Marin in Finland, and not only her, but her whole coalition. She's the prime minister, and she is 34. Uh, and she has a coalition of, I think, four or five parties, all led by women, all under 40. And then let's not forget Angela Merkel, the, the senior leader uh, in Germany, who is perhaps today the most respected politician in the world. And then, you know, last but not least, I should also mention your Marina Silva in, in uh, Brazil, who also is a systemic thinker, thinker with profound ecological values embodying this kind of leadership. So, um, we, we need to uh, spread the news that these leaders exist. We need to support them and help them in any way we can. And oh, you had a question the, about Leonardo also. Yeah, but not DiCaprio, Da Vinci. No, no. no. Well, Leonardo Da Vinci was a great genius who made significant contributions to intellectual thought in many, many disciplines in, uh, besides, you know, being a genius as an artist, a painter, sculptor, and, and so on. Uh, and Leonardo uh, did tremendous work in, in botany, in geology, in anatomy, in the science of flight. I mean, you name it, you know, practically all the fields of knowledge at his time. But there is one area that he was not interested in, and that's the social sciences and politics. So, so uh, I don't think he would be a good leader today because that's, this is something he was not interested in. Um, when he lived in Italy in the 15th century, this was a very turbulent time. There were wars all the time. There were, you know, the Venetians fighting against the, the, the Lombards and against the Tuscany, the, the Medici in Tuscany, and the Pope in, in Rome and, and, and Sicily, the King of France. They, they were all, you know, fighting each other and alliances shifted. And they all, whoever was in charge and in power, adored Leonardo and he had a good time with whatever leader was in power and so he he didn't meddle in in any of the politics and was just not interested. We got a message here saying but Leonardo was a respected advisor to, to many kings so maybe he was kind of working behind the scenes. Yes but I don't think a, an advisor in, in politics, in, an advisor in many other things in technology, in, you know, among, among others in military engineering, but he also designed the canals of Milan, which were very important for agriculture and for business in general. So, so he was an, an advisor in, I think, in business, in industry, in technology, but, but not in politics. Right. Um, I, want to, I want to stick to the topic of, of leadership, but looking at it more from an individual perspective, I mean, not all, not all of us will be great leaders, but we can all kind of take the, the helms of our own lives and, and lead. And what we see is that um, um, as we look at society, globally speaking, um, there is a larger pandemic that's running loose for the past many years. It's the pandemic of mental health. So people are suffering from depression, anxiety, and addiction like never before. And the apparent solution has been to consume more and more and more. Can you speak to the symbiosis between the diseases of the mind that perhaps prevent us from leading our own lives and these civilizational crises? So are we depressed, anxious, and addicted because the world is falling apart? Or is the world falling apart because we are depressed, anxious, and addicted? Yeah, an interesting chicken and egg question. Uh, well, you know, my work leads me to believe that uh, the development of the mechanistic paradigm became so excessive that we took it as the truth rather than a very successful model to describe reality. Uh, the mechanistic worldview uh, was a revolution 
at the time of Descartes and Newton and Galileo. This was the new paradigm. Aristotle was the old paradigm. Galileo and, and Descartes and Newton were the new paradigm. And it was extremely successful, but then, you know, uh, was exaggerated. And uh, we believed uh, that the world was a machine. Now, if you believe the world is a machine, if you truly believe that, then the best way to interact with it is to control it. I mean, if, you know, when I drive my car, I had better control my car, otherwise I get into trouble. So that's the proper way to interact with machines. But if the world is a living network, then control is not the proper attitude. So there is a sort of balance that we need between control and self-assertion on the one hand, and integration and cooperation on the other. And what I'm seeing is this uh, imbalance, this very broad imbalance in our value system between self-assertion and uh, integration. We have too much competition, too much uh, expansion, extraction, domination, and not enough integration, conservation, partnership. Now, it's interesting that the ancient Chinese sages uh, thousands of years ago picked up on that, on this very uh, um, essential characteristic of life, this balance between self-assertion and integration, and associated these fundamental Chinese concepts of yin and yang with integration and self-assertion. I say they are fundamental features of life because when we look at living nature, we see networks within networks. We see systems within systems. So every living system is an integrated whole and is also part of a larger system. Being an integrated whole, it needs to assert itself and uh, being part of the larger system, it needs to integrate itself into the larger system. So there's this balance of self-assertion and integration we need to achieve. And let me maybe just add, Lorenzo, that um, in order to achieve it, I think uh, the best strategy is to create and nurture communities wherever we can. Because in community, we enjoy relationships, we enjoy mutual dependence, we enjoy cooperation. And community is also the best antidote to the daily corporate onslaught we are having with advertising that tells us, you will be happy if you buy my product. And if we find happiness in human relationships rather than material consumption, in other words, in community, that's the best way to go. And that's the best way to, to maintain our sanity. You know, Fritjof, this week, your, your good friend Otto Scharmer from MIT, he, he wrote a, a piece where he says that 2020 uh, bears some similarity to 1989 with the, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Only that today, we see a different type of wall collapsing. And I think it's a little bit of what you talked about. It's not a wall between systems that's collapsed, but a wall between system and self, uh, the wall that's kept us separated from each other for, for way too long. Um, and I think that's interesting uh, because uh, we are our own salvation in a way from this uh, uh, situation that we've created for ourselves. In fact, the other day uh, I was asked um, what we can do for ourselves uh, to get us out of this crisis and immediately the word empathy uh, came to mind uh, mm -hmm. because I feel like feeling empathy is, is wired into our biology. Uh, everything from our autonomous nervous system of the heart, our mirror right. neurons, the intuitive vagus nerve, our mysterious pineal gland at the geometric center of our brains. It seems that whoever designed us did so in a way that we could feel each other's pain and happiness, uh, each other's love and sadness. And yet we know very little about our own biology and we've numbed ourselves as a society. We don't feel the pain of nature. We don't feel the pain of others as we potentially could and should. So how do we become empathetic again? How do we make this general anesthesia fade away? I understand that building community is, is obviously one way to do that because we, the conviviality in and of itself uh, yeah, creates would, this kind I of would, exchange uh, of energy. Right? 
Yeah, I would uh, say that building community would, would be the way to go. And, uh, you know, thinking of what you just said, I would say that nobody designed us that way, but we became that way in evolution. And uh, scientists have shown now that chimpanzees have empathy. So our cousins, the great apes, you know, have evolved in the same way because it uh, presented an evolutionary advantage to be empathetic at a certain stage. And so, yes, uh, community is, is a way to go. And, uh, you know, I have been to Brazil many times, as you know, and, uh, you know, you were one of my gracious hosts in Brazil and showed me around in, in Sao Paulo, and I really appreciate that time. So I know a little bit about Brazilian life and Brazilian culture, and I know about the joyfulness and the creativity and the diversity of Brazilian culture. And uh, I'm, I have never thought about empathy, but tell me, is, is that also a special Brazilian trait? because that could be really a model for the world. That's, that's a tough question to ask. Uh, I'm a, an idealist by nature, so I, I, would, I would want to respond that yes, there, there's something about uh, the Brazilian way of being that uh, is very warm uh, by design, by essence. Right. Uh, but the, the current reality that we're living here in Brazil uh, doesn't really uh, sustain that. Uh, it's, it's a very polarized moment. There's a lot of antagonism. There's a lot of hatred. Uh, there's a lot of conflict. And there's a lot of suffering as well. Yes. Uh, so it, it's hard to see uh, at this moment that, that what was once a defining characteristic of the Brazilian way of being. But I have hope. Um, I feel that uh, uh, at, there's an expression in Portuguese which says, at the bottom of the well, there's a spring, mm -hmm. you know, from which you can kind of reinvent yourself. And I think we've, we've hit rock bottom. So at some point, we will propel ourselves into yeah. something different and better. And perhaps the, these character traits of joyfulness, joie de vivre, and, and uh, yeah. uh, diversity and empathy are deeper than the current crisis and will re-emerge. Yeah. Let's hope that. Let's hope. Um, before we, we transition to uh, the last uh, segments of, of, of this dialogue, um, I wanted to ask you a personal question. Uh, Wikipedia says that you are 81 years old, and I find that extremely hard to believe. Can you confirm that this is true? And if it is, where in the world does your vitality and your good health stem from? I know, for example, that you don't use WhatsApp as a communications tool. Can you inspire us with your reasons for that? And what other habits are you very zealous about? And how are these your own individual behavioral responses to your personal critique of our current reality? Well, uh, the WhatsApp question is easy to answer. Uh, yes, I'm 81. And... Uh, I don't use WhatsApp, I don't use social media, and that's a question of age. If, if I were 20, 30 years younger, I certainly would use these media. But I'm uh, very much in demand as it is, you know, still very active. I'm, I'm on uh, two or three Zoom conversations every week now, and so I don't need more connectedness. I'm connected enough. I teach an online course, the Capra course, about the systems view of life, and I've taught it for four years, and I have a, an alumni network of 1,500 people around the world with whom I keep in touch. So, so more connectedness is not what I need. That's, that's why I, I, I keep you know, these uh, limits on myself. Otherwise, uh, to keep, uh, you know, vigorous and, and healthy, I do a lot of things because when you get older, you have to take care of, of your body and mind. So, uh, you know, I eat healthy food. I eat very little meat, no beef, basically a Mediterranean diet. I take food supplements like vitamin D, C, fish oil, Currently, I take massive amounts of vitamin C because research has shown that with, with COVID, uh, the symptoms are easier to bear should you get sick with massive amounts of vitamin mm. C. Um, uh, I play tennis. I practice meditation. I practice Tai Chi as, as a meditative uh, practice. Uh, and I'm, as you know, intellectually very active. Um, I speak four or five languages, 
and, and they say that uh, the, the brain uh, plasticity is really preserved and enhanced when you speak several languages. So German is my native language and I speak German, English and Italian every week practically. I speak French quite often and I'm fluent in French also. I get, a, I get by in Spanish and I speak quite a bit of Spanish here in California. Uh, my Portuguese is more limited. Uh, I need a caipirinha to really get going in Portuguese. But you know, these, these mental uh, practices as I think also help. So that's, that's how I live. In summary, I think you do much, much more than, than most of us, <laughs> which mm. is quite extraordinary. Um, you did mention the Capra course, and I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to understand how they can get involved. Um, I'm gonna sh we're going to share a uh, share screen now with some information on the course. If you can briefly oh, okay. let people know how they can get involved, that'd be great. Yes. Well, this is uh, a course which uh, was uh, filmed actually in Brazil. It uh, has... 12 lectures, one a week, so it goes for 12 weeks. And the lectures were filmed in Brazil, you can see on the picture, a very comfortable, beautiful environment with the kind of same background that Lorenzo has right now. And uh, a, a group of people sitting comfortably. Uh, and so um, the course, uh, runs twice a year in spring and in the fall. And uh, here you've got the website capracourse.net and we start the next course in September. I should mention that the course includes a discussion forum in which I participate every day during the course online, exchanging ideas, answering questions with the participants. We have a limit of 200 participants so that we can manage the discussion forum. And uh, as I say, we have a very large alumni network. We have study groups led by participants. And so I'm building up a network of systemic thinkers and activists. And I'm very excited about that, really fulfilling a dream I've had for a very long time. Great, thank you for sharing. This last uh, section before we transition to guest questions uh, is what we call in Portuguese ping pong because we go back and forth. The idea is that I'm going to make you 10 uh, questions and uh, the invitation is that you answer with the first thing that comes to your heart without thinking too much. Okay. Shall we? All right. So the first question, a beautiful thing that you saw or heard in the last three to four months that renewed your sense of hope. Uh, the fact that fish can be seen again in the canals of Venice. If you could choose any one person to have dinner with, who would it be? Bob Dylan. What profession did you want to take on when you were a young child? Actor. What's your favorite word? Love. When was the last time you cried and why? Uh, at the outbreak of the pandemic. What keeps you up at night? Uh, my work. One word to explain the current pandemic. Crisis. A personal feeling about everything you've accomplished in your life. Gratitude. A book that changed your life. Physics and Philosophy by Werner Heisenberg. Last question, how do you feel right now? Fabulous and very warm. Fantastic. So okay. we'll, now, we'll now turn to, to our, our- When I was a teenager, I used to be very good at ping pong, you know? <laughs> and so I, I still can do it mentally. There you I'm go. very happy about that. So we're now gonna to turn to our guests for some questions. And uh, we'll start with a renowned Brazilian neuroscientist who is conducting truly groundbreaking research around psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and incidentally, his great uncle, uh, Mario, he wrote the foreword for the Brazilian edition of your book, uh, The Tao of Physics, uh, back in the 70s. Right. So I'd like to invite Dr. Eduardo to uh, ask his question live. Welcome, Eduardo. 
Hi, Lorenzo. Hi, Fritjof. Uh, Hello. So, very nice to meet you. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, I started reading these books. Yeah. I hope you can recognize them. Yes, I recognize <laughs> all of them. Yeah. And they were uh, very, very important to me. And about 10 years ago, I also visited the Center for Eco Literacy in California. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate uh, all your teachings and books. Uh, this one specific, this is uh, the Portuguese edition that has a foreword uh, written by my uncle, a Brazilian physicist. And your books were very important uh, to me. And now in retrospect, I can more clearly understand that they somehow uh, allowed me to have a defense against <coughs> The, the pervasiveness of the materialistic and reductionistic approach in science, which is thought not, on, not as, a, as a useful model, but as, as you said, as the truth. So in, in the universities, we, we simply learn that and it goes unquestioned. And your book helped me to, to learn how to question the, the, the prevailing paradigm. And later on, I somehow uh, kind of took a very risky path in my career as I decided to study psychedelic substances, which some 10 years ago, this was like a, a suicidal topic in academia. Fortunately, it's not anymore. Uh, I'm also trained by Stan Groff, and I know you two exchange a lot over the years. And in this edition of the Tao of Physics, uh, you briefly mentioned in the foreword about uh, Castaneda and the plants of the gods and some of your experiences. Uh, so summing up of everything that you talked with Lorenzo uh, today, I would like to ask your current opinion and views about this interface of psychedelics, the fields of consciousness and systems thinking in neuroscience, and also and maybe more importantly, uh, the therapeutic potentials of psychedelic assisted therapy, which is now uh, moving very strongly in science with promises to heal uh, severe cases of PTSD, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, drug addiction, and so many of the, the mental afflictions that more and more people are suffering with. Yeah, well, you are right, uh, Eduardo. The, um, the current renaissance of psychedelics is really very remarkable. And is, it's a re renaissance, as you said, that is science-based and, and uh, therapy-oriented. Uh, uh, in my personal life, uh, psychedelics played a big role uh, in the 1960s. Uh, which were my formative years. That's where I, I acquired my basic way of thinking and my values. And I began to read books about Eastern mysticism. I practiced meditation and I experimented with psychedelics. This was before I met, long before I met Stan Groff. I met Stan Groff in 1978 and um, uh, we are close friends and did uh, many things together, had many discussions in, in private and in seminars and workshops for many years. And uh, recently, um, somebody made a documentary about Stan's life and they interviewed me. And there is a half hour interview uh, where I talk about my relationship to Stan's work and the fact that we were comparing worldviews from three perspectives in our seminars, the psychedelic or transpersonal perspective, the perspective of Eastern mystics, and the perspective of quantum physicists. And so this was a very inspiring dialogue. And I can tell you that this half hour interview which will uh, soon be available in public, and I'll, I'll be happy to send you the link. This half hour interview is, is one of the best interviews I ever did. It was you know, professionally filmed with perfect lighting, perfect sound, and I was very inspired and, and really 
uh, reminisced about this uh, very exciting time in my life in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So, you know, to sum it up, uh, Stan's work and the work in psychedelic uh, therapeutic research in general is now fully vindicated by the system's view of life and, and the kind of ideas I've been discussing with Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I loved when you talked about uh, integration and self-assertion. And do you think like uh, the psychedelic experience when properly done and conducted in a, in a safe setting uh, can help people achieve uh, integration and, and self-assertion? Yes, I, I, I think so. And, and you know, uh, a strong psychedelic experience is maybe a little too much integration. <laughs> because you you lose yourself you know completely uh but, but or you find yourself completely or you find yourself yes <laughs> but that's uh, that that's good for uh, you know uh to to change the imbalance so so i agree thank you thank you thank, thank you Varda, for your question thanks so um our next question uh we turn to someone who considers you uh, to be a longtime mentor. Uh, Marina Silva was a three-time presidential candidate in Brazil, former minister of the environment, former senator, today a leading global environmentalist, as you well know. Uh, she sent us a video as she was not able to be with us in person. So here she is. Let's try that again. Um, the volume is, is not working. Bear with us. No livro A Teia da Vida, você propôs a imagem da rede e as metáforas biológicas para descrever o mundo e até mesmo os avanços na civilização. O avanço das tecnologias da informação e das redes sociais pareciam dialogar muito com essa ideia, mas nos últimos anos essa tecnologia vem sendo usada para disseminar conflitos, agressões e ataques aos sistemas democráticos, principalmente na Europa e nas Américas. Gostaria de conhecer suas reflexões sobre esse fenômeno, sobre suas consequências e possíveis desdobramentos para o futuro. Yes. Well, uh, Marina, hello. Let me tell you that's a great pleasure indeed to see you on, on video. Uh, I still remember our many meetings in Brazil. And in fact, behind me, you see a wall of photographs and up in the right corner is a picture of us two that was taken in, I think, 2003 or so when we did uh, a series of dialogues in your capital in Brasilia. So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be in touch with you again. And you ask the, a really important question. Um, when uh, networks became a very important part of our society and culture, not only in science, but in, in uh, uh, social life, with social networks, with uh, the internet, the World Wide Web. In, this happened during the 1990s. There was a whole technology, uh, information technology revolution. When that happened, a new global economy was created uh, based on networks of flows of information and money. And this economy was created explicitly without any ethics incorporated. So there was only one value that was programmed into these computers, the value of making money for the sake of making money. So when there was a decision to be made, investing money in one way or another, the uh, decision was programmed into the computer to go in the direction of more profit, irrespective of human rights, health, environmental protection, and so on. 
Now, the technology is such that these human values and ecological values could have been programmed into the computers. And that's what we need to do. We need to add an ethical component. Now, with Lorenzo, we have spoken about values in this conversation several times, but uh, I want to emphasize once more that systems thinking is not enough in this story. We need to, to add an ethical dimension. We need to put ethics on the table to put values on the table. Now, ethics is commonly uh, discussed in terms of philosophy, religion, and so on. But there's also a scientific approach from the systems view uh, point of view, because ethics is behavior for the common good. And throughout evolution, nature always created communities of life in which individuals acted for the good of the community as a whole. And those communities had an evolutionary advantage. So ethics as uh, behavior for the common good is a very general um, perspective. And in my view, the key values uh, which need to be observed are the values of ecological sustainability and of human dignity. And it's not easy to lay this out in detail, what this implies. But fortunately, we have a magnificent document that does that, and that's called the Earth Charter. The Earth Charter was created by the United Nations 20 years ago in a unique process of global collaboration. And if you read it today, it's still fully valid. It is a declaration of 16 values and ethical principles to create a sustainable, just, and peaceful world. So I recommend this very highly. Those are the kinds of values that we need to embody in our networked economy and in our networked society. In fact, on, in, on Monday evening, you participated at the International Festival of the uh, Earth Charter, uh, celebrating 20 years of the Earth Charter. So we will be making that link available so everyone can see uh, three hours of different uh, uh, talks from people from all over the world. Right. Very, Thank very you. inspiring. Uh, before we transition to the third question, uh, I want to let everybody know that Fritjof was kind enough to stick around for uh, 15 more minutes than planned. So we will be running 15 minutes after the hour. For those of you who need to leave uh, before that, don't worry, we'll be sending a recording of this video to everyone this week uh, to all your emails. So the third question comes from uh, a native of Ghana, a former top level executive at Nike, who today is doing a brilliant, brilliant job speaking out for racial justice in corporate America. So I'd like to invite Danny to ask his question. Welcome, Danny. Hey, hi. Good morning, Hello. good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Oh, um, amazing. Okay. I'm in California. Where are you? I, I'm actually in Portland, Oregon, two hours away from I you. see. I'm down the road with neighbors. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I think this has been an incredible, very insightful uh, hour. So I appreciate it. You know, Lorenzo and I go way back. I worked at Nike, as he said, as the former vice president of brand innovation for 13 years originally from Ghana, grew up in, in the UK. So I have a very worldly perspective, if you will. Um, spent some time in Holland as well. And in the, all of that time, I, you know, obviously we're talking about systems. In this case, I wanted to address, you know, it's not necessarily that different in the room, but the idea of systematic racism, right? Yes. Which of course we know is pervasive and it's, and it's top of mind right now uh, in the world at large. My, my personal experience is that, of course, I've experienced this um, in yes. multiple different ways. And one of the, I found my, what I found to be really toxic and really damaging was this idea of racism being something that is really death by a thousand cuts. You know, I think society at large up until this point have described racism as this blunt object of white supremacy. You know, they're violent. You can kind of almost see them coming visually. My experience of racism is way more subtle than that, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's subtle. It's, um, it's oftentimes, you, it goes undetected. It's hard to sort of quantify and validate in order to solve the problem. 
And so my question is, as you know, in the spirit of, you know, systems and the ways that systems can be used to solve some of these social issues, when you look at something like, you know, these subtle death by a thousand cut race, racism experiences that a lot of people in the black community have, it's hard to know how the system can help eradicate that. Because I think that that, that type of racism is probably the most damaging psychologically for the black community. So the question is, is there a solution to this as we sort of reimagine the future state of the world we live in and the roles that these systems play? And how can these systems help sort of mitigate some of those things? Because I think a lot of the time those things go undetected. Yeah, I think this is a, a really deep question and a really tough question. And, uh, you know, I can tell you right up front that I don't have an answer uh, because uh, it, it would really require an exploration, uh, a much longer exploration, but maybe we can do that someday. And yeah. we'll sit down really for an hour, you and I, and maybe some other people, uh, maybe Lorenzo would be interested in that and, and really explore it. Uh, what I can say right away is that the COVID pandemic has shown us, as I mentioned before, that uh, social justice is no longer a political question, but is a question of life and death. And it has also shown us that ecological balance and social justice go hand in hand. Today, in my view, uh, the greatest uh, uh, threats to human civilization are the climate emergency and economic inequality. And economic inequality of, uh, you know, is, is connected with, with racism in, in many ways, in many subtle ways. But I, uh, I really don't uh, have an answer in, in detail. Uh, in recent days and weeks, I experienced this uncertainty uh, at a personal level with the question of statues, you know, the statues in, in the U.S. that right. are now being defaced and turned down. And, you know, some uh, to, to, to topple the statue of a slave trader as, in, as they did in Bristol in the U.K., you know, it's easy to understand. You know, George Washington is a little more difficult to understand. Christopher Columbus is a little easier again and right. but there are others you know and you don't you don't know uh, it, racism is so ingrained in in our society that and um, you know I don't have the American experience I've been in this country a long time now about 40 years but I was born in Austria and uh, you know my experience was more with anti-semitism you know because uh, I grew up just after World War II and still remember the, the Nazi period, you know, from my childhood. But uh, I, I would, would say, um, let's, let's sit down someday and, and really explore this. It's a very fruitful and could be a very healing uh, action to, to explore that in detail. Absolutely, so, I would, yeah, I would, I would love that. I think um, it's one it. of the things, and this is what's exciting about these, these topics. And, and what, first off, I'm grateful for the platform to be able to have these discussions. I think, you know, if you were to go back two months, the chances are that the world perhaps wasn't ready to have these dialogues. So this in itself, for me, is already a progressive step in the right direction. Yeah. And then I think, you know, having minds like yours, um, sort of look at this situation, look at some of the social upheavals and, and rethink the systems that are powering it, I think can do a lot for humankind. I wrote something down that you said that I thought was really powerful. You know, this, this notion of ethic is behavior for the common good. I yeah. think that, that yeah. I love that. I think that there is a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think when you think of systems and ethics and how those two things can sort of coexist, uh, in order to serve the greater good. There is some, some interesting areas there that I think we can explore. So I would absolutely love to take you up on that invitation with Lorenzo, I think, um, and you obviously share the findings with, with the broader groups. Great. And now that we're all stuck at home, you know, it's a good time, a good time to do that. Exactly. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank great to meet you. You too. Thank you, Danny. You're an inspiration to us all. Keep up the good fight, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you.
All right. Uh, the, the next question comes from uh, our, ma our managing partner at Mandala, New York, Bill Malison. Uh, he's one of the most uh, articulate systems thinkers that I've ever met. He also sent us a video as he's sheltering in the mountains of uh, Oregon uh, at this moment. So he doesn't have a reliable signal. So he sent us a video. Take it away. So there's, a, there's a strong Oregon connection here. Hello, this is Bill Malison, managing director of Mala in New York. Uh, my question is about uh, a great piece that I read recently in which you did a retrospective uh, called Pandemic Retrospective and you look back from 2050 and you would imagine the world as if we had solved some of the most systemic uh, issues that we have today. I wonder if you could talk about that process, what you went through, uh, how you got inspired, and then maybe some tips for how we can do this type of work and do these type of future fiction stories on our own. Thank you. Yes, well, I, I wrote this piece with Hazel Henderson and I was inspired to write it because as the pandemic began, we saw that uh, it had many, many tragic consequences for individuals and communities in terms of personal health, health and, you know, illness and death. And then uh, because of the lockdown, and uh, you know, businesses closing, uh, the world health crisis was accompanied and still is accompanied by a global economic crisis. So those are all the, the tragic consequences. At the same time, we got news, as I mentioned already, that since there are no more cruise ships in the Venetian lagoon and other tourists stayed at home, the fish can be again seen in the canals of Venice. That, that really hit me. And at a personal level, I could see when I look out of my home office over the San Francisco Bay, it was clear, the air was clear as it, as it had been 20 years ago. There was no smog, no pollution, and that's still the case. Uh, I also read many news that ecosystems around the world are uh, regenerating life. Life uh, is uh, recovering and flourishing in, in many, many ecosystems. So while the uh, health and economic news has been very bad, the environmental news has been very good. And so I thought that uh, Gaia is really teaching us uh, some very important lessons. Uh, the uh, effects of COVID-19 on the economy have happened because of a radical reduction of human activities. And in the same way, the positive effects on the environment were the consequence of the same radical reduction of activities. Now, the same positive effects could happen not by radical reduction, but by radical change of human activities. If we had in the San Francisco Bay, if we had public transportation and electric cars, there would be no pollution. If we managed our tourism uh, more wisely and did more community development locally, ecosystems around the world would still flourish and so on. So the question is, can we apply the lessons that Gaia teaches us to the climate crisis, to our economic crisis, and the various other facets of our uh, multi-level crisis? So that's the basic idea. Great, we have uh, two questions from the chat uh, regarding uh, indigenous culture and indigenous heritage. I think it's, it's more than appropriate that we bring this up, especially since the uh, ancestral traditions <coughs> of the indigenous people uh, is being absolutely destroyed, massacred here in Brazil uh, by the current government. Um, and also you mentioned that, you know, the answer to this crisis is blowing in the wind. I tend to think that the answer to this crisis is with our ancestors who figured out how, to, uh, how, this, how the world turns uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. So here are two, two questions. Uh, how do you see the wisdom of elders and indigenous cultures being restored in current society to create new solutions inspired by ancient ways of being and seeing the world? This is a question from Elsie Iwazi. 
And uh, Beatriz Bizio asks, are indigenous and oriental civilizations, which don't have individualism as a primary value, which cultivate a different view of the world, very much more connected with nature, are these the ones that will guide us and guide humanity uh, at this moment, at this crossroads that we're facing? Well, uh, it could well be if we, if we listen to them attentively, if we honor them and respect them and, and listen to them. Uh, the, uh, the way of many indigenous cultures, and I, I don't want to be sort of sentimental here and say that every indigenous person is a wise person, that's, that certainly uh, would be exaggerating. But it is true that many, many indigenous traditions uh, have this ecological wisdom that, that we are talking about. So among Native American tribes, for instance, uh, it was common and is common to talk about nature as all my relations. And from a system's point of view, that's, that's actually literally true. We know ever since Darwin that there is a vast network of genetic relationships throughout the world, going back to a single ancestor. So, you know, the, the trees that I see behind you and, and uh, you know, the banana leaves and, and the animals, the insects, the microorganisms, these are our relations. So, so it, uh, it is very valuable to uh, listen to these indigenous um, uh, wisdom keepers. It's also true that uh, indigenous peoples are very often on the forefront of the environmental struggle these days. Just think of the Canadian Idle No More movement and their opposition to the, the various pipelines that, that are being uh, opposed by us environmentalists. So uh, they, they also uh, deserve not, our, not only our respect, but our you know, financial and organizational support. I'm happy to say that uh, at the Center of Ecoliteracy, we worked with an indigenous leader from British Columbia, uh, from the Okanagan tribe uh, for about 10 years or so to uh, shape our pedagogy. Her name is Jeanette Armstrong, and she was of tremendous help in uh, you know, shaping an ecologically oriented pedagogy. So we used this indigenous wisdom to, to, to shape our work, and, and I recommend this very highly. Great, I wanna be sure to honor our, our limitations on time. Uh, for those of you who sent questions that were not addressed, Fritjof was kind enough to uh, agree to answer them over the coming days. So the first 10 questions that were unanswered you will receive a response uh, via email. Um, I wanna thank everyone from all over the world. I've seen people from almost all continents uh, manifest uh, their, their support and their presence here today. Thank you for being part of this dialogue. Uh, thank you to everyone at Mandala as well who supported this initiative over the past few weeks. And Fritjof, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. It's always thank so thank special you, to be with you. I wanna invite everyone to join us on July 15th uh, at the same time as today's webinar, that's 2 p.m. Brazil time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for the last of our series of 10 webinars. Uh, we're gonna be joined by Hop Clap, who's the founder and the former CEO of the North Face brand, Joanna Seddon, the president of Global Brand Consulting at Ogilvy, New York, and John Grant, sustainability expert and author of the Green Marketing Manifesto. We'll be discussing how marketing can play a positive, transformative role in designing our post-COVID world. So to all, my very, very best, and until next time. And Lorenzo, let me say goodbye in the Brazilian way. Um abraço. Um abraço. Thank you, Fritjof. Thank you very much.